for some reason it won't let me start recording whenever I'm in sh uh, share screen mode. All right, you should be able to see my screen. Let's go to chapter nine. And we'll talk about long, long lived assets. Chapter nine, uh, accounting for long lived and intangible assets. So let's jump right into it. There's three categories of long-term assets. We have our plant assets, our intangible assets, and natural resources. So we'll go through each of these. Plant assets are the things that you normally think of when you think of assets. Um, or when you think of long-term assets. So land, buildings, equipment, furniture and fixtures, PP&E, property, plant and equipment, on companies' balance sheets, that category is often given to summarize all of them. But not always, they're, sometimes they're broken down in, uh, by individual long-term asset. And then we have our intangible assets, so these are assets that lack physical substance. So you can't, you know, you can't um, touch them, feel them, taste them, see them, smell them. All You can't recognize them with the five senses, but they are assets. They lack physical substance. Copyrights, trademarks, patents, franchises, these are examples. <coughs> and we'll talk about um, each of these a little bit, not we won't go into a lot of detail um, in a little bit. And natural resources, these are resources supplied by nature. So examples would be timber stands, uh, mineral deposits, oil and gas deposits. So like say you're, um, say you're a, a, um, a tree company, you sell lumber. Uh, you might have land on your balance sheet as an asset, but then you might also have a natural resource, a timber stand. So the land on your balance sheet as your, as, as your plant asset would be the land that your factory is sitting on. And then your timber stand, that's also land, but that land you intend to take the trees off of and sell the trees. So you would call that timber stand as a natural resource. It's not, it's not a plant asset. They would be distinguished separately the land on which your factory sits and the land where the timber sits, those are not both treated as land on the balance sheet. One's land and the other one is a timber stand. One's a natural resource, one's a plant asset. Hopefully that makes sense. If you intend to take the land and use it for your primary business and make money off of it, then it's a natural resource. So accounting for long-lived assets or long-lived assets, uh, whoops, back up. Things you have to consider, the acquisition cost, also known as the historical cost. Um, you have to take the acquisition cost and you have to expense it. So transfer, the, the acquisition cost of the asset initially is recorded as an asset. And then over time, you take Part of that cost and you transfer it to an, to expense or another way of thinking of that is the asset deteriorates in value so you have to consider that and that that process is known as depreciation for plant assets uh, we also have to consider how do we determine the treatment of future expenditures on the original assets and then when we dispose of the asset uh, how do we account for that so we're gonna talk about these things. Acquisition cost. So when you purchase a long-term asset, you record the purchase at the asset's acquisition cost. The acquisition cost includes the purchase price. It includes all, all costs that you have to incur to not only acquire the asset, but to get the asset ready for its intended use. So it, it often isn't just the purchase price. 
if you have to pay to ship the asset to your, to have the asset shipped to you, that's also part of the acquisition cost. If you have to pay someone to come in and uh, assemble the asset, assembly cost, that's part of the acquisition cost. If you have to pay uh, sales tax on the purchase price, that's part of the acquisition cost. If you have to pay someone to come in and um, examine the asset to see if it's ready, if it's, if it's ready to go, if it's ready to be used, all those things are part of the acquisition cost because they're cost incurred to get the asset ready for its intended use. So here's an example. The, the company buys this piece of equipment. The gross invoice price was $10,000, but the company paid within the discount period, so they got a $100 discount. And the sales tax was $500. So the purchase price was what, $9,900 plus $500. So 10,400. Uh, and then other costs that are also gonna be treated as part of the acquisition cost are shipping. So they had to pay $200 for the asset to be shipped to them. They had to pay $500 for the asset to be installed. And then they had to pay $300 for the asset to be tested to see if it's ready to go. So they had to pay $1,000 of additional cost in addition to the purchase price to uh, get the asset you know, ready for its intended use. So the total acquisition cost is the ten is the eleven thousand four hundred dollars. All right. What happens if you purchase, um, say, you purchase a piece of land, as a, and, and the land has a building on it, and the building has equipment inside of it. So essentially, you've purchased three assets, but you've paid one price, right? This is known as a package purchase. And so the question is, how much of that purchase price do you allocate to the equipment? How much of the purchase price do you allocate to the land and how much do you allocate to the building? These are three separate assets on your balance sheet, but you only paid one price for everything. Right? You bought a piece of land, it has equipment and a building. It has equipment and a building. Um, can you please mute your mics? Somebody's mic is making noise and it's, and it is uh, disruptive. Please mute your mic or um, is there a way I can mute it? They're not paying attention either. Is it still? Okay, I think, I think they muted, all right. So how do you do this allocation? So if you pay a million dollars for three things, or let's see the example. Yeah, uh, if you paid $190,000 right here and you got three assets, you got land and on the land there's a building and inside the building there's equipment. How much of the $190,000 do you allocate to the land? How much do you allocate to the building? How much do you allocate to the equipment? Well, you do it based on, it says right here, the allocation is done based on relative market value or appraisal value. So what you do is after you buy this asset, this once you make this package purchase, you get someone to come over to your property and look at the land, the building, and the equipment and appraise their appraise the value. Or if you don't do that, then you you look on eBay or you look on Amazon and try to find you know an asset that's of similar age and use as this as my asset that I just bought what's it going for in the market what are people paying for you try to assess the market value so suppose you have this independent appraiser come in and assess that the market value of the land is 60,000 the market value of the building is 120 and the market value of the equipment is 20 and so the total market value is 200,000 so you do it based on relative market values 60,000 divided by 200,000 is 30% so 30% of the market total market value belongs to the land. So you should allocate 30% of the purchase price to the land. So 30% times 190,000 equals to 57,000. You would debit land for 57,000. What would you debit building for? Well, the building market value represented 60% of the total market value. So 60% times the purchase price is 114,000, you debit building for 114,000. And then the remaining 19,000, you would debit equipment, credit cash, and there's your journal entry. 
Also, we do need to consider, and this will come up here in a second, the not in allocating the purchase, not in this right here, we don't need to consider, but for depreciation, we need to consider this estimated useful life. And uh, the useful life of an asset is how long the company expects to be able to use the asset to generate revenue. It's not necessarily its um, physical life. The asset uh, will often have a longer physical life than, it, than, it, than its useful life. Uh, for example, if you buy a computer, a laptop computer, the useful life of a laptop for me is about two to three years. I mean, the thing will, will last five to six, but for me, I usually would get a new one after two to three. It's, that's the use I would get out of it. So you can see there the useful life versus the actual physical life. Land has indefinite uh, useful life. There is no useful life to land. Um, just by, by the gap says that land, the generally accepted accounting principles say that land uh, always treated as, a, as if it has an indefinite useful life. But then the other assets you have, the other plant assets, um, you need to estimate, company estimates the useful life of them based on their own needs. Other expenditures related to land. Um, all costs, so it says all costs necessary to bring the land into a condition for use should be treated as part of the acquisition cost of the land. That's what capitalized means. Should be treated as an asset first, not an expense. So this includes any property taxes on the land, insurance that you've purchased whenever you bought the land, uh, in case something happens to the land and you, need, you wanna make a claim. Uh, legal fees, whenever you purchase the land, often you have to hire a lawyer if it's a you know, certain tract of land and there's some legal stuff and you have to pay that person. That's treated, the amount you pay them is not treated as an expense, it's treated as part of the cost of the land, capitalized. Any fees you have to pay to remove old buildings. So say you buy a piece of land and it has two dilapidated buildings on it and you're not intending to use those buildings. You're intending to tear those buildings down and build a factory on the land. Uh, the cost of tearing those dilapidated buildings down is not treated as an expense, it's treated as the cost of the land. It's part of the cost of the land. So it'd be added to the purchase price of the land and all of that would be capitalized and called land, debited land, debited land, credit cash, and any special assessments. Any net recoveries from selling removed items reduce the capitalized cost. So for example, so suppose you buy a piece of land for a million dollars and it has a dilapidated building on the land and you have to pay $30,000 to remove that building. And then also in addition to that, let's say uh, there's a piece of equipment in that dilapidated building that you actually are, are able to sell for say $5,000. And say those three things are the only relevant things to the, to the land. What's the acquisition cost? Well, it'd be the purchase price a million plus the $30,000 that you had to pay to remove the dilapidated building. So 1 million 30,000, but then minus the 5,000 that you got from selling that piece of equipment out of that old building. So net recoveries from selling removed items reduce the capitalized cost. So it'd be 1 million plus 30,000 minus 5,000. So 1 million $25,000 would be debited to land, credit cash. Uh, limited life items of land improvements. So if you make improvements to the land, like you pave, a, you pave a road to get to your factory on the land, make a driveway or a fence around it. Um, those things should not be called, the, the amount you spend for those things is capitalized. It's not treated as an expense, it's treated as an asset, but it's not treated as land. You would debit an, another account um, called land improvements. They're treated separately. But don't worry about that particular um, technicality. That won't be on the exam or anything. Leasehold improvements are also accounted for separately. Leasehold improvements are think, suppose you, um, you lease a building, you lease your factory, you don't own it, you lease it, but you make an improvement to your factory. Um, if you intend to, so some leases, 
work in, in such a way as you lease the you lease the um, the asset like a building, and at the end of the lease term, you have an option to purchase the asset, and it becomes yours. You own it at, at the end of the lease term. It doesn't really work like that when you rent an apartment, right? It's not. But for some leases, companies it works that way. So they don't own it, they're just leasing it. They pay a monthly lease fee, but at the end of the lease term, they have an option if they want to, to purchase the asset. So if during the lease term, you made some improvements to that asset, and then at the end of the lease term, you actually purchase that asset so it becomes yours, then those improvements that you made are called leasehold improvements, and they're also become yours as well since you own the asset. Those should be treated separately. Um, that's all you need to know in regard to leasehold improvements. You don't have to know anything else other than that. All right, select the correct answer. Sienna paid 30,000 for a new specialized machine. So that's the purchase price. In addition, they paid $600 to transport the equipment to its installation location. Then they paid an additional 300 to have the equipment professionally installed. Sienna expects the new machine to lower their operating costs by $5,000 in the first year. What's the acquisition cost of the equipment? Purchase price, shipping, installation cost. So $30,900B. Yes, the, the machine might lower their operating cost by, th by 5,000 in the first year. But as of right now, the first year hasn't happened. Acquisition cost is just all costs necessary to get the asset ready for its intended use. So it would just be the 30,900. All right, depreciation. So there's a lot of stuff in chapter nine. I'm, I might have to go kind of fast to get through this and I might go over uh, in terms of my time. In terms of 105, I might go past 105, but I'll upload the lecture in case you have to leave. Depreciation, depreciation this chapter has a lot, uh, a lot of the questions on the exam a large portion of the questions from chapter nine. There are 14 questions on exam three from chapter nine. And um, uh, at least half of them are about depreciation. So plant assets, land, building, equipment, uh, furniture and fixtures, these are depreciated uh, except for land. Land's the only one that's not. So all plant assets other than land are depreciated. It's useful for you guys to understand what depreciation is. A lot of people have um, a misnomer or uh, a myth in their mind about what depreciation is. They think it's something, but it's really not. Uh, a plant, so a depreciation is just simply allocating the plant, the assets acquisition cost which is originally that the dollars that we spend, we originally spent to acquire the asset and get it ready for its intended use. We treated those dollars as an asset, right? We debited that asset for those dollars. And so all depreciation is, is allocating that asset, that acquisition cost to expense as we use the asset, as we use the underlying asset. The idea is all that initial cost is spent to acquire an asset. Then we're going to use that asset to generate revenue. And so as we use the asset to generate revenue, we should recognize, we should transfer a part, a part of that, as, that asset's original cost to expense so that the expense and the revenue are matched. Like the asset deteriorates in value, why is the asset deteriorating? Because we're using the asset, hopefully, to make products and sell the products and get revenue, right? That's the whole reason that we bought the asset in the first place. We don't just buy an asset and it sits there, and we have no intention of using it to earn revenue. The idea is we purchase an asset because we want to earn revenue. Uh, we want to use it to earn revenue. And so as we earn revenue, we should be allocating part of that asset's original cost to expense. And that, that process is known as depreciation. Now, the period that we're depreciating the asset is the asset's useful life. And we talked about that the asset's useful life may differ from its physical life. Remember my example with the laptop. When I buy a laptop, a laptop's useful life to me, two to three years, it's physical life. Heck, a laptop could last, last 10 years if you take care of it. But for me, after two to three years, I'm gonna buy a new one. 
So that's what the concept of useful life is. How long does the company think they're going to use the asset to generate revenue before they decide to sell the asset? Another thing that's relevant when we talk about depreciation is salvage value. So the salvage value of an asset is what the company thinks they can sell the asset for at the end of the asset's useful life. So here's what depreciation not is not. A lot of people think that it is it, it, depreciation is used to value the asset. Depreciation is a systematic allocation of the asset's original cost to expense so that we match expenses to revenue. Depreciation is not intended to align the book value of an asset to its market value. So how do we calculate depreciation expense? Um, it depends on what method we use. So you're gonna learn straight line method, declining balance method, and the units of production method. You're gonna be responsible for these three methods. So let's look at the straight line method. There are three variables in the straight line method. There's the acquisition cost, there's the useful life, and there's the salvage value. So the formula for depreciation expense in a given year is acquisition cost minus the salvage value. So the numerator is known as the depreciable cost. The acquisition cost minus the salvage value, that's that is what we're depreciating. And we divide that by the asset's estimated useful life. Who gets to estimate the useful life of the asset? We do. The company who purchases the asset makes that estimate. And so if we have this equipment that costs $5,000, it has a three year useful life, and we think we could sell it for $500 at the end of its useful life, that's its salvage value, then the depreciation expense we'll recognize each year is. $1,500. They call this the straight line method because if you made a graph on the x-axis, the horizontal axis, we have time, years. Imagine year one, year two, year three. And on the vertical axis, the y-axis, we have the dollars of depreciation expense. If you graphed it, it's a straight line, right? It's $1,500 in year one, year two, year three. So that's why they call it a straight line method. As we go through time, depreciation stays the same. It's the same every year. What's the journal entry for depreciation? We debit depreciation expense. We credit, we don't credit the asset. We don't credit equipment. We credit accumulated depreciation for that equipment. So we'll make three of these journal entries for this piece of equipment. One at the end of each year. And so that at the end of year three, the balance in the accumulated depreciation account will be equal to the salvage value. No, will be equal to, uh, sorry, sorry, $4,500. And then the book value at the end of year three of the equipment would be the salvage value. So it'd be the original acquisition cost. Whatever the balance in the equipment account is, 5,000, minus the balance in the accumulated depreciation account, 4,500, book value be 500 at the end of year three. You can't depreciate an asset below its um, salvage value. So here's the table. So equipment has a $5,000 balance at the end of all three years because when we purchase the equipment, we debit equipment for 5,000, credit cash for 5,000, and we don't make any adjustments to the equipment account until we sell the equipment. Each year, we're recognizing $1,500 of depreciation expense, and so the balance in the accumulated depreciation account is going up. At the end of year three, the balance in the accumulated depreciation is 4,500, the balance in the equipment account is 5,000, so the book value of the equipment is by definition, the balance in the asset account minus the balance in the accumulated depreciation account. So it's $500, which is the salvage value.
The second method of depreciating is the declining balance method. And we can decide. The company gets to decide what method they want to use. GAAP allows companies to decide that. Um, so the declining balance method is an accelerated depreciation method that calculates depreciation expense in a given year as a constant percentage of an asset's beginning of year book value. And so since the asset's beginning of year book value is going down over time, and we're taking a constant percentage times that book value, the depreciation expense we recognize each year is going to go down over time, hence declining balance. It's an accelerated depreciation method. In the early years of an asset's useful life, we, we recognize more depreciation expense than in the later years. So there are many versions of the, of the declining balance, and it's based on this percentage. What, what's the percentage going to be? So the most common one used by companies is a double declining balance. So uh, assume the same uh, example we had before. We have a piece of equipment that costs five thousand dollars, and there's, we estimate it has a three-year useful life. We estimate we can sell the equipment for five hundred dollars at the end of its useful life. So that's the salvage value, and we're going to depreciate it using, say, a double declining balance method. So an accelerated method. How do we find the depreciation each year for the equipment? Well, first, remember this formula. The depreciation each year, if we use the double declining balance method, is going to be equal to the book value of the equipment at the beginning of a given year times the double declining balance rate. So the only thing that's going to change year over year in this equation is this. This is just going to be the same number. It's the same rate. It's a constant rate, constant percentage. So this will be getting smaller and smaller. So the product of these two things will be getting smaller and smaller. So you have to set up a table. You don't have to, but it makes sense to set up a table. So in year one, uh, accumulated depreciation has a zero beginning balance. The beginning book value is $5,000 right? Because it's the balance in the equipment account minus the balance in the accumulated depreciation equipment account. So 5,000. We multiply that by our double declining our double declining balance rate. And I'll talk about how to get that. And that gives us our depreciation expense for year one. So let's talk about how do they get this rate here, the 66.67%. Uh, um, this, this is known as the DDB rate, double declining balance rate. So the DDB rate is equal to one over the straight line rate. Uh, is that right? No, it's not. Sorry, that's not right. The DDB rate is equal to two, double, double declining balance, two times the straight line rate. What's the straight line rate, you ask? The straight line rate is just one over the useful life. So in this example, the straight line rate is one third. Each year, we're depreciating the asset 33% under the straight line method. Right? If we take our $4,500 of depreciable cost and we multiply it by one third, we get $1,500 each year. Then that was the depreciation under the straight line method. So the straight line rate is one over the useful life in years. So one third. And so two times the straight line rate, two times one third is the DDB rate. So the DDB rate is the 66.67%, two thirds. So that's the formula for the DDB rate. Two times the straight line rate. There's a triple declining balance method. 
and the triple declining balance method uses the triple declining balance rate. And the triple declining balance rate is three times the straight line rate, or 100%. You would depreciate, all the depreciation would be in the first year if the asset was a three-year useful life, for example. But most companies, if they use an accelerated method of depreciation, they'll use the double declining balance method. They'll use a DDB, the double declining balance rate. All right, so let's go back here. In year one, we got this depreciation. That makes sense. So this is the depreciation expense recognized in year one. So we would debit depreciation expense for $3,334. We would credit accumulated depreciation for $3,334. So at the beginning, the beginning of year two, the balance on the accumulated depreciation account, 3334. The book value at the beginning of year two, 5,000 minus 3334, 1666. So following this formula, the depreciation in year two is the book value at the beginning of year two, 1666, multiplied by two thirds. So the depreciation in year two, $1,111. Debit depreciation expense, 1,111. Credit accumulated depreciation, 1,111. That means at the beginning of year three, the balance in the accumulated depreciation account is this balance, which was the balance at the beginning of year two, plus the extra amount we added in year two. So the balance at the beginning of year three is the 4,445. So the book value at the beginning of year three, 555. If we multiply 555 by 60, by two thirds, we would get, um, a number way bigger than $55, right? $55 is 10% of 555. So what's going on here? Um, well, let's talk about it. What is 555 times two thirds? You would get, let's, let me get, pull out my handy dandy calculator. Essentially $370. All right. If we recognize $370 as depreciation in year three, what would the book value at the end of year three be? So we would add 370 to this. So the balance in the accumulated depreciation account would be at the end of year three, the balance and accumulated depreciation would be the beginning balance plus the depreciation we added in year three. It'd be 48.15. And so what would the book value of the equipment be at the end of the assets useful life, at the end of year three? It'd be 5,000 minus 48.15 or $185. But $185 is less than the salvage value. You, we don't depreciate assets below their salvage value. That's the rule. So what that means is if you blindly apply this DDB method, and in the last year or in any year, if recognizing the amount of depreciation that the method says to recognize, in this case 370, if that leads to the book value of the asset falling below the salvage value, then you can't do that. You only depreciate the asset down to, to where the book value is equal to the salvage value, but no, no further. And so we know we can't put 370 here because that makes the book value 185, which is less than 500. So we have to ask ourselves the question, what should we put here such that the book value after we put a number here is um, equal to the salvage value, right? So, um, 5,000 minus something has to equal 500. This is the balance in the accumulated depreciation account at the end of the asset's useful life or at the end of year three. So the balance at the beginning of year three was 44.45, right? The balance in the accumulated depreciation account can be no bigger than 4,500, right? We can't have a balance bigger than 4,500 because then 5,000 minus 
something bigger than 4,500 is going to be less than $500. And so the question is, you know, we want X to be 4,500 and we can't get any, we can't, uh, X can't be any bigger than that. So essentially, um, the amount that we have to recognize in the final year is the 4,500 minus the 44.45 or $55. I guess another way to think about it um, that makes that maybe a little uh, simpler is, let's erase this. Another way we can think about this that's equivalent to what I just said, but simpler, let's scratch this, is just um, the total depreciation expense we recognize on the asset. This is the total. This is the balance of the accumulated depreciation account. It can't be any bigger than 4,500. So the first two years add up to 4,445. And so we know this can't be 370 because that's definitely gonna take us over 4,500. So we, we start, we put the 370, we're like, wait, then the, then the total, um, Depreciation will be bigger than the asset than the than um, forty five hundred, and so we're like no, nope. and so this is just let it equal x, and solve the equate solve this equation right thirty three thirty four plus eleven eleven plus x equals forty five hundred solve for x you get fifty five dollars. But the key thing is we don't depreciate the asset below its salvage value. And then the final method of depreciation that you need to know is units of production. So we went over straight line, we went over double declining balance. Oh, let's go back. The DDB method, it's called an accelerated method and I think you could already see this. Let me erase this stuff. If we graphed, if we graphed the depreciation expense each year against time, oops. So if we if we graphed on this axis is the dollars of depreciation expense and on this axis is time. And then in year one, we recognize 3334, that's somewhere up here. In year two, we recognized 1111, that's somewhere right here. 3334 is 1111. And then in year three, we recognize $55, somewhere like right here. What's happening to depreciation over time? It's declining, right? Hence the declining balance method. Units of production. In the, with the first two methods, the depreciation is all in regards to time, right? But with the units of production method, um, we depreciate based on the asset's use rather than based on time. For some assets, if you don't ever use them, it doesn't matter how much time goes by. They, they're still, they're fine, you know? They can just sit there and if you don't use them, use is what makes them deteriorate, not time. So for assets like that, it makes sense to use a units of production depreciation method. And so for this method, we, we need to calculate the depreciation per unit of production. And the units of production will depend on what type of asset we're talking about. Suppose we have a vehicle and we feel that it appreciates based on miles driven. So the units of production in this case would be miles driven. So in our denominator, we have to estimate when we buy the vehicle, we have to estimate how many total miles can we drive uh, this vehicle over its useful life. Suppose we think the useful life, of, so the useful life, we're still dividing by useful life, but it's in units of production, not, not years. Someone have a question? Okay. So we, we estimate what's the total, suppose miles driven is what we think is what causes the vehicle to, to deteriorate. So we have to estimate what's our what's the useful life of the vehicle in miles driven. Suppose we say hmm, probably two hundred thousand. After two hundred thousand miles, we'll get rid of it. We have no use for it anymore. That's its useful life. 
200,000 miles driven. Whether that takes two years to do that or 10 years, it doesn't matter. It's just 200,000 miles driven. It's not based on time, it's based on miles driven. And then we just take our acquisition cost minus our salvage value, which is what we think we could sell the, the vehicle for at the end of its useful life after we've driven it 200,000 miles. And we just divide it by um, our total estimated you know, useful life and miles driven. And that gets us the depreciation per mile per unit. And then for a given year, we just multiply this, this rate times how many miles we drove it that year. And that gets us our depreciation expense for the year. So that's how the units of production method works. Um, for some assets, it might not be miles driven. They, what if the asset is a, is a machine that you're using to make uh, one of your products on? So the useful life of the machine might be number of units that the machine made, or it might be number of hours the machine was used. So here's, a, here's an example. We have a piece of equipment. It's estimated to last 9,000 hours. So the units of production here are hours, hours of use. So it's useful life to us is 9,000 hours. Uh, we bought the equipment for 5,000. We expect to be able to sell the equipment for $500 after we've used it 9,000 hours at the end of its useful life. So the depreciation per unit per hour is the uh, depreciable cost divided $4,500. That's what we're depreciating. We're depreciating $4,500 over 9,000 hours. So we expect the thing to depreciate at a rate of 50 cents per hour. And then let's suppose in year one, we use the equipment 2,000 hours. So our depreciation expense is just 2,000 hours times 50 cents per hour, $1,000. In year two, we use the equipment 4,000 hours. So the depreciation is $2,000. Year three, we only use the equipment 500 hours. Depreciation is $250. Year four, we use the equipment 1,500 hours. So the depreciation is $750. And then now again, um, if at any time using this depreciation rate times the hours gets us to a depreciation expense such that when we add them up, we get greater than $4,500. We can't do it that way, right? We can't depreciate below salvage value. But in this example, they created exactly to where it's depreciated right down to salvage, to exactly to the, where the, the uh, book value of the equipment would equal the salvage value at the end of its, well, then, then we've reached the end of its life. So if you add these um, hours up, they should equal 9,000. And so this is how you do it. So if we plotted with the units of production method, if we plot depreciation expense against time, it's not gonna necessarily be a straight line. It's not gonna necessarily be an upward line or a downward line, right? Here, it's 1,000 in year one, then it goes up 2,000 in year two, so it actually goes up. But then in year three, it's only $250, so it's way back down. Year four, it's up again. Year five, it's down a little bit. So when we graph units of production, depreciation against time it there's no it's not always going to be straight up down it's usually going to be you know like this because our use is usually like this right we don't use it necessarily more hours every single year or less hours so this is units of production a lot of companies use that for for their assets I mean, a company gets to decide for a given asset what method of, of depreciation they want to use. For, for their equipment, they could use units of production. And for their building, they could use double declining balance or straight line rate. They don't have to, they're not required to use the same method for every asset, for every plant asset. So those three methods, straight line method, declining balance method, and units of production method, these are methods that GAP says a company can use for to do the depreciation on their plant assets um, for financial reporting reasons. The IRS, when the company goes at the end of the year, file their income tax return and decide how much, how many taxes they owe the IRS, the IRS doesn't, the IRS has, has 
has a certain depreciation method that the company has to use for tax purposes. And it's not straight line units of production or double declining balance method, declining balance method. It's a method called MACRS, Modified Accelerated Cost Recovery System. So you don't have to know what MACRS is or how that method works. That method's more complicated than the ones we um, talked about. All you need to know is that for a given company, the method they use for depreciating their assets for financial reporting purposes is often different than the method they use for tax reporting purposes. So for example, that means that the, the total depreciation expense in a given year that shows up on the company's income statement in the, in the line depreciation expense, the dollars there, say $50,000, that number is not the depreciation, usually that's not the same depreciation the company reports on their income tax return because the macro system of depreciation is different than straight line method, double declining balance method, units of production method. You're going to get different numbers. You'll learn what the macro's method is and how to do it in uh, it's either 311 or 312 if you go on to take that. I think, uh, I think 311. Counting 311. All right, so here's a summer, um, a quick check to see if you understand what we've been talking about in regards to depreciation. Uh, Jaeger or Jaeger, Jagger Incorporated purchased a new machine at a total cost of 25,000. The machine is expected to have a five year useful life, and at which time it is expected to be sold for $5,000. So that's the salvage value. Which of the following is true regarding depreciation in the first year? So it looks like each choice, you have to give the depreciation expense using the straight line method, depreciation expense using the double declining balance method. So let's see. Straight line method, we would take acquisition cost minus salvage value. That gets us our depreciable cost. We're depreciating this cost, $20,000 over five years. So that's 4,000 per year. For each of the five years. So either B or C are right. A and D can't be right because it has 5,000. So it's 4,000 for the straight line method. And now we need to decide, is it 8,000 for the DDB way or the 10,000 for the DDB way? So the double declining balance method, well, first we need to find the DDB rate. DDB rate is two times the straight line rate. So it's two times, the straight line rate is one over the useful life. Straight line rate is always one over the useful life in years. The DDB rate is two over five, which is 40%. 40% of what? Beginning of year book value. The depreciation in a given year is going to be calculated as the book value at the beginning of that year times 40%. At the beginning of year one, because we're, we're looking for the depreciation in year one, what is the beginning book value? The beginning of year one, the book value is what we originally paid because we haven't depreciated the asset at all. There's no accumulated depreciation. Beginning of your book value, 25,000, multiply by 40%, and that gets us our depreciation expense in year one using the double declining balance method. So 40% of 25,000, I believe, is 10,000. Yeah, so C is the right answer. Hopefully, that makes sense. Of course, they're going to work through it on the next slide, I believe. No, they, they don't work through it. So I'll work that for you. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, another thing that's relevant re relating to um, assets, plant assets, are uh, impairment losses. So if the value of a plant asset, in other words, the book value, 
the book value of a plan asset becomes less than the, than the asset's future cash flows from, that, from a given moment in time. No, if the book, if the future cash flows, if the, so at the end of every period or every year, the company should assess what cash flows do I expect to be able to get as a result of using this equipment in the future? And then say they come up with some dollar number. If that number is less than what we're saying the book value of the asset is, then the asset is called impaired. It's deemed to be impaired. And we have to recognize an impairment loss. The impairment loss is the difference between the estimated future cash flows and book value. And we write the asset, um, we write the asset down. So here's an example. Equipment originally cost 100000 And let's say its accumulated depreciation to date is 60000 so at the end of whatever year, say year five, um, say the asset has a 10 year useful life. We've been depreciating it each year. At the end of year five, the balance in accumulated depreciation is 60,000. So the book value of the asset is 100,000 minus 60,000. Book value equals 100,000 minus 60,000 equals 40,000. At the end of year five, we look into the future. And we expect that this piece of equipment is only going to generate cash flows of 10,000 into the future for us. So for the next five years of its useful life, year six, seven, eight, nine, ten, we're only going to get ten thousand dollars from using this piece of equipment. You know, from from making some products with this equipment and then selling the products. We're only going to get ten thousand for whatever reason. Maybe because the the product we're making with this equipment is becoming obsolete. We're not able to sell as much. And it, whatever the reason is the fair value of the equipment is $10,000, which just means our estimated future cash flows is 10,000. So the equipment at the end of year five is only gonna generate this much for us in the future. And we're saying right now it's worth $40,000. The equipment is impaired. Whenever the book value is greater than the estimated future cash flows, the equipment is impaired. Now, if this number, if the estimated future cash flows was greater than the book value, we wouldn't do anything. That's fine. But if the estimated future cash flows is less than the book value, the asset is impaired. And so we recognize an impairment loss. We need to write the asset down from 40,000 to 10,000. So a $30,000 impairment loss. So the journal entry is we debit impairment loss for 30,000. This is like an expense. It would show up on the income statement in the, um, the section titled other expenses losses section the other section, but um, this is like an expense. So impairment loss, 30,000. And then we don't credit equipment, we credit accumulated depreciation. So we just add 30 extra thousand dollars to the accumulated depreciation account. By doing that, the new book value of the asset will be 10,000, right? Because it'll be the original cost, 100,000 for the equipment, minus the balance in the accumulated depreciation account. The balance before the impairment loss was 60, after the impairment loss, the balance would be 90 because we added 30,000. And so the book value would be 100 minus 90, which is equal to the estimated future cash flows. So we wrote the asset down. The company, according to GAP, has to do that, has to assess for each asset they have, for each plant asset they have, not land, for any of the depreciable plant assets, buildings, equipment, furniture, and fixtures. At the end of every accounting period, they have to assess whether the asset is impaired or not. If it is impaired, they have to do a journal entry like this. <clears throat> All right, let's move on. Revenue expenditure versus a capital expenditure. This is the part of um, this chapter that's the most, how to, how to say it? It's ambiguous. Often it's hard to know, there's a lot of confusion. Um, on the exam, chapter nine questions on the exam, remember I said there were 14 of them, 14 questions on exam three come from chapter nine. 
Uh, there are very few, if maybe one, that goes over this. So you'll see in the in the online homework and in the some of the stuff we do when we work the end of chapter problems, example problems for chapter nine, when we do that on Thursday, you'll see we'll do a few of these actually. And you'll see sometimes it's ambiguous what the answer is. Don't worry too much about that. Uh, it won't show up on the exam. And the one that does show up on the exam, it will show up on the exam, but not very much. And the ones that do show up, they won't be ambiguous. So you might wonder, what do you mean by ambiguous? Well, let's look. There's two types of expenditures. Uh, say we purchase a plant asset. While we're using that asset, while that asset, it's in its useful life, there are two types of expenditures related to that asset. We have revenue expenditures and we have betterments. A revenue expenditure is treated as an expense. So we debit. We, we, these are things that don't extend the useful life or make the asset, extend the useful life of the asset or make the asset better to use. They're just upkeep on the asset to keep it in its usual running condition. So any dollars we spend for a given asset for maintenance, repairs, those are just treated as expenses. We debit expense, debit miscellaneous expense, credit cash. These are called revenue expenditures. We don't capitalize those costs. We expense them. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> <clears throat> the costs we capitalize, a good term for those is betterments, right here. Whoops. Any cost that we incur related to an asset that extend the useful life of the asset, improve the quality or quantity of the asset's output, or reduce the operating cost to us from using the asset, reduce the asset's operating costs. These costs are treated as an asset. They're debited to the asset itself. So say we're take, talking about a piece of equipment and we, we add some, or say we're talking about a building and we add a, a separate wing on the building. So now the building's bigger and we can use it. We can have more space to use. The cost of adding that second wing on the building is debited to building. The cost is treated as an asset. It's not treated as an expense. We don't debit expense. Why? Because that building that we that that, that wing that we added um, definitely improved the quantity of the output we're going to get out of that building. Um, so it satisfied one of these three things. Right? We have another wing. We have more production space. We can make more products. But now you can kind of see why I was talking about that. It's kind of a fine line, a little ambiguity. Does this cost that we've incurred for a given asset, does the cost extend the asset's useful life? Does it improve the quality or quantity of the asset's output? Does it reduce the asset's operating cost? If the cost that we've incurred for a given asset doesn't do any of these three things, then the cost is treated as an expense. If it does do one of these three things, one or more of these three things, then the cost is treated as a capital expenditure or added to the asset, treated as an asset. All right, learning objective four, when we dispose of an asset, uh, what, how do we account for that? What are the journal entries? Well, when we dispose of an asset, we can sell the asset. We could retire the asset, which means we don't sell it. We just, we kind of like sit it in the field and let grass grow up around it, but we don't try to sell it. That's a, that's a retirement. We're not gonna use it anymore, but we're not gonna sell it. Or we could exchange the asset for, for another asset. Well, I guess a selling the asset is exchanging it for another asset. We exchange the asset for cash. Uh, what, what exchanges means, means we exchange one plant asset for another plant asset. Like we exchange one building for another building, or we exchange five of our pieces of equipment to someone else and they give us a building in exchange. That's an exchange. So when we record, when we, when we journalize the disposal, we have to remove the asset from our books. So we have to credit the asset, credit equipment, credit building. Um, we have to also remove the assets accumulated depreciation, right? 
if we don't have the asset anymore, we don't have the accumulated depreciation anymore. So we would have to debit accumulated depreciation because accumulated depreciation has a normal credit balance. So we have to debit that. Um, we have to debit cash, record the proceeds. And then we have to either debit or credit a gain or a loss or gain. Credit in the case of a gain, debit in the case of a loss. Because the cash we get may be greater than, equal to, or less than um, the asset's book value. If the cash we get is less than the asset's book value, then we're going to need two debits. We're going we're to need, a, not two debits, we're going to need a debit, three debits actually. Debit cash, debit accumulated depreciation, and debit loss. Credit equipment. If the cash we get is uh, greater than the book value, then we have a gain, right? We're getting more than what we think the asset's worth. So our debit cash, debit the accumulated depreciation, so two debits, and then two credits, credit equipment, credit gain, gain on sale of equipment. So that's hard to keep track of in your head, but if we have an example, it'll make more sense. So we have this vehicle. It originally cost us $20,000. So our original journal entry was debit vehicle 20,000, credit cash 20,000. So the vehicle T account is sitting there $20,000. The accumulated depreciation on the vehicle Um, the balance is sitting at 18,000. And now we sell this vehicle. What's the journal entry? The book value of the vehicle is 20,000 minus 18,000, $2,000. And we sell the vehicle for 3,500. So we get 3,500 for a vehicle that to us is worth 2,000. So there's a $1,500 gain here. So we're going to debit cash for 3,500. That's what we get. We're going to get rid of the accumulated depreciation, debit accumulated depreciation, 18,000. So now the balance of accumulated depreciation is zero, which it should be. We don't have the vehicle anymore. We're going to credit the vehicle for 20,000 right here. Get rid of the vehicle. So now the balance of the vehicle is zero. We don't have the vehicle anymore. There should be no balance on the account. And then if you made this debit, and you know to make this debit and this credit, we, we need another credit, right? The debit sum up to 21500 and the credits are 20000 So we need another $1,500 credit, and that's called gain on sale of equipment. The gain is just, uh, the gain or loss is the cash you get minus the book value. If it's a negative number, then the cash you get is less than the book value, it's a loss. We would have three debits, one credit. If it's a positive number, so the cash you get is greater than the book value, then it's a gain. We're going to have two debits and two credits. So maybe I can write gain or loss is equal to book value at the time of sale minus cash received from the sale. If, uh, if this is negative, it's a loss. If it's positive, it's gain. No, if it's negative, it's um, gain. If it's positive, it's a loss. All right. We've talked about plan assets. Now let's talk about intangible assets. Remember, there are three categories. Plan assets, land, building, equipment, furniture, and fixtures. In summary, PP&E, property, plant, and equipment. Those are the plant assets. Now let's talk about intangible assets. These include things like copyrights, patents, trademarks, and then we'll talk about natural resources. So intangible assets are things, they're economic resources that do benefit the company's operations, but they don't have a physical substance, When we acquire an intangible asset, we record the intangible asset at its acquisition cost. 
similar to plan assets, intangible assets are depreciated. We do transfer their cost, their acquisition, the initial historical cost of the intangible asset to expense over the intangible assets life, useful life. But that process is not called depreciation for intangible assets. It's called amortization. And, it, and we don't think of useful life, we call expected life, expected life. It's the same idea though. <laughs> it's just we use different words. But unlike plant assets, when we do the amortization entry for the intangible asset, we debit amortization expense. We don't credit accumulated amortization. We credit the intangible asset itself. We credit copyright or we credit patent. I think I lost my internet connection all of a sudden. Which is not good. Yes, I did. It's going to come back here in just a second. We're going to have to wait. Okay, I'm back. Sorry about that. My internet uh, temporarily went off, but now it's back. So back to sharing my screen. Hopefully you guys can still hear me. I apologize for that. The, the recording didn't stop though, so whenever I upload the lecture, it'll, it'll still be all, all time. Hopefully you guys, are you guys here? It says there's 45 people in here. Can you guys hear me now? Yeah, all right. Thank you. All right, intangible assets, um, we talked about the, they're amortized, not depreciated. And when you make the journal entry, with plant assets, you debit depreciation expense and you credit accumulated depreciation. With intangible assets, you debit amortization expense, but you don't credit accumulated amortization. You credit the intangible asset itself. You credit patent, you credit copyright. So that's what this final bullet point is saying. There's no accumulated amortization um, with intangible assets. The types, a patent, what is a patent? It's it just the holder of the patent gets the exclusive privilege. Um, so patents are for inventions. If you're an inventor, you invent something, you and you want uh, you don't want anyone else to be able to make that same thing and sell it and get money. You want to be the only one that can make that thing and sell it and get money. Then you have to go to the United States Patent Office and you have to apply for a patent. It's kind of expensive. There's a fee involved, and um, if you get the patent, you essentially get a piece of paper saying you have the exclusive privilege of making this thing and selling it for money. And it lasts for 20 years. So the useful life, or the if you want to think of it as the, um, the expected life of a patent is 20 years. So patents are amortized over 20 years. Um, that you, how do you calculate the amortization? It's the same, um, most companies, they just use the straight line method. They don't use an accelerated method or anything like that, just straight line. It would just be the cost of the patent divided by 20. And that, that would be the amortization expense each year. Salvage value, uh, there is the concept of salvage value is there, but most of the time salvage value is zero. So don't worry about the calculation of amortization much for intangible assets. Just kind of know what an intangible asset is, know that we have, that they are amortized, not depreciated. It's the same concept, it's just a different word. Also know that there's no accumulated amortization. Whenever you recognize the amortization, you debit amortization expense and you credit the intangible asset, you credit patent, you credit copyright, you credit franchise, you credit trademark. And then also know what the types are. Like what is a patent? Just know this in general. What's a copyright? Um, this is for writers uh, or painters. So it protects the owner of the copyright against unauthorized use of their work. And so the useful life of a copyright or the expected life 
is the life of the author plus 70 years. So I guess it's a little ambiguous, right? Because time you, at the time you get the copyright, you don't know how, long, how much longer you're going to live, but the expected life is, um, it's equal to, to until you're dead plus 70. Nobody can, uh, you know, use your work or, but after that, they legally can. A uh, franchise is just an exclusive right to operate or sell a specific brand of product in a given geographical area. So if you own a Subway franchise here in Binghamton, you know, Subway sandwiches, then, and there's a couple, there's a few of them, right? But in a given little area, um, you have the right within your store to make and sell subway sandwiches as the subway brand so that's a that's a that's an asset that's a that's a benefit to you and it's a franchise trademark this is the right to use certain terms names or symbols so um like walmart has all the slogans that companies have like walmart has a slogan always low prices and then after that you see a little t they've trademarked that slogan no other company can use that as their slogan. It's an intangible asset. And then another one we didn't talk about is Goodwill. Goodwill is companies are not companies, but um, students often with Goodwill I don't really they're confused about it. Goodwill essentially only arises when company A when a company purchases another company. So say company A purchases company B. Um, say companies, say company uh, B, B's net assets, so company B's assets minus the liabilities is $30,000. That's a small number, but let's say it's 30, say it's $30 million. So company B's assets are 100 million and their liabilities are 70 million. So their net assets are 30 million. That's what you're purchasing. And company A pays uh, 40 million to purchase company B. So company A paid 10 million more than company B's net assets to purchase company B. Then company A would record goodwill of 10 million. It's the amount paid by company A for company B, another company, that's above the net assets of company B, the acquired company. So company A would record the 10 million goodwill. We paid 10 million more than what they were worth, essentially. Natural resources. <clears throat> These include um, examples would be, you know, a timber stand, stand of trees that you intend to sell. Uh, say you have land and you can get gas out of it or oil iron ore, coal, gold, silver, other metal ores. So when you purchase the natural resource, you know, when you purchase the oil field, when you purchase the track of standing timber, you record the purchase at the acquisition cost, which includes the purchase price plus any other um, costs that you incur to get the asset ready for its intended use, plus exploration and development costs. All those costs are, call, are treated as, are capitalized, are treated as the cost of the natural resource. And how, do, how are natural resources depreciated? So plant assets are depreciated using one of those three methods we talked about. Intangible assets are amortized using the straight line method, essentially. Natural resources are depreciated. So we, we use the word depreciation again, but depreciated um, using a, a method that's very like, very much like the units of production method. Um, but the word, actually the word we use for natural resources is depletion. So plant assets, depreciation, intangible assets, amortization, natural resources, depletion. We deplete the natural resource. So we're gonna recognize depletion expense, and then we're gonna have the accumulated depletion. So natural resources do have the accumulated account. 
So the journal entry to recognize depletion expense for a natural resource, debit depletion expense, credit accumulated depletion. How do we figure out the amount? We use the unit, uh, a units of production sort of method. And we deplete them over their expected useful lives, just like with the plant assets. Um, we'll get into example of natural resource depletion um, on Thursday when we work end of chapter problems. All right, how do we present long lived assets or long lived assets on the balance sheet? What does it look like? Well, here's an example of a real company, Weyerhaeuser Company. Um, this is their the asset section only of their balance sheet. And so we see comparative balance sheets. We have 2016, 2017 dollar amounts are in millions. So we have their current assets right up right here. And we've talked about those, you know those. We've already talked about those in the course, cash and cash equivalents, cash receivable inventories, prepaids. We have the total current assets. And then we have their long-term assets. So we have their PP&E, less any accumulated depreciation. So there's the balance at the end of 2017, there's the balance at the end of 2016 in millions. We have construction in progress. That's a long-lived asset, long-lived asset, however you want to pronounce it, that we haven't talked about. Um, it's like a plant asset. You don't need to know that, though, for the exam. You'll learn more about construction in progress in uh, 311, I believe. So don't worry about that. And then we have some natural resources here. We have timber and timberlands um, at their at the acquisition cost, less any depletion, less any less whatever the balance and accumulated depletion is. So this company, Warehouser Company, they're actually a tree company, so that you can see their largest asset by far is their natural resource that they own. And then we have another natural resource, minerals and mineral rights, less depletion. And then we have goodwill. Goodwill, the balance in goodwill didn't change. And then other assets, don't worry about that. These could be um, some sort of long-term investments that they've, you know, they bought stock in another company and they intend to sell it uh, later. So it's it's an asset, but and it's a long-term asset, but it, it just classify that as other. Don't worry about that. Real estate, stuff like that. Land that they've bought that they intend not to use to sell, you know, or not to use for their factory or use to, um, they only intend to, to hold on to it so the value goes up and sell it. That could be down here in the other assets. So we have our PP&E, that's a plant asset. We have our construction in progress, it's like a plant asset. We have these two natural resources and then we have this one intangible asset. So that's what it looks like on the balance sheet. This is an example. And then the final thing in this chapter that you need to know are these two ratios, the return on assets ratio and the asset turnover ratio. And so when we analyze assets, we want to, we want to assess the ability that the firm is, has to use their assets efficiently and effectively. And so the rate of return on a company's assets is the most commonly used measure of that ability. So return on assets is just the net income that the company generated in a given year divided by the average total assets that they had over that year. So this denominator, you've seen this before, right? It's an average. So we get the beginning of the year total assets plus the end of year total assets divided by two. That's the denominator the average total assets. And the idea is, in a given year, if our average total assets is say $10 million, that's you know the value of our, of our uh, how to say it? That's the value of our revenue, revenue potential. With that $10 million of assets, we can do stuff with to get revenue. So on the, to get a return, essentially, right? That 10 million is like our investment our initial investment. What do we divide the 10 million by? We divide it by our return. So return on our investment. In a given year, our revenue minus our expense, let's say was a million dollars. 
So we got a 10% return on assets, $1 million net income divided by average $10 million investment. We got 10% return on investment, return on assets. So you can see how this ratio, return on assets, measures the ability of a company to use its assets efficiently and effectively to generate money. And then the other ratio is the asset turnover ratio. And this also does the, assesses the company's ability to effectively use their assets, just like the return on assets ratio. But in, in particular, it indicates how effectively a firm is able to generate sales from its assets. So it's just net sales revenue. Net sales revenue, right? So sales revenue, gross sales revenue, minus sales discounts, minus sales returns and allowances. So net sales revenue divided by our average total assets. So it's um, it's a measure of our $10 million down here in assets. And then how are we able to turn those assets over? We turn an asset over whenever we essentially sell it and get revenue from selling it or use the asset to make products and sell those products and get revenue from that right so we turn it over um, so this essentially this ratio is similar to the return on assets ratio um, but the return on assets ratio is probably a more uh, descriptive measure it's it's a better more accurate measure of the company's ability to use their assets rather than this measure because in the return on assets ratio, we, we get all revenues minus the expenses. We subtract off the expenses. But this, this uh, in this ratio, in the numerator, we don't subtract the expenses. Um, so it's not, it's not as, um, I don't think it's as an accurate of a measure, but this is asset turnover. So here's a quick example. Nash Company reported net income for the year 120,000. Cash flow from operating activities of 150,000. That seems irrelevant. That's just extra information given to try to throw you off. Total average assets of 1.5 million. And during the year, they paid a cash dividend of 40,000. What was their return on assets for the year? Return on assets is just net income divided by average total assets. So 120,000 divided by 1.5 million. These other information is irrelevant. So 120,000 divided by 1.5 million, 8%. And then they don't have an example of asset turnover, but you guys can, we'll do one on uh, Thursday. And that, Every chapter has a section on corporate social responsibility, as I said at the beginning of the course. And I just sort of skip over these. We talked about it at the beginning, and uh, we don't need to rehash it over and over. I think you guys know what corporate social responsibility is, and it's very important these days. Um, but I don't need to say that every single time. So that's the chapter. That's chapter nine, long lived, long lived assets. And on Thursday, we're going to uh, go through some examples, uh, end of chapter problems. Are there any questions before I uh, quit? So Janelle asks, are the questions on exam three in order of the way we go over them in the lecture? By chapter, yeah. The first 14 questions on exam three are chapter nine. Then the next, I don't remember how many questions are chapter 10. Then chapter 11, then chapter 12. Yeah, they're in order. Uh, Christopher asks, can you go over again? Oh, can you go over gain or loss on sale formula? Yes, there, there was a little, um, I remember when I was doing that earlier, there was a little uh, confusion, I believe, because I said the formula one way and then I wrote it the other way. So let's go back and do that. Gain, on, uh, gain or loss on sale. So let's go back. I'll do that really quickly here. That was back here. If we go back to when we dispose of our assets, we're going to have a gain or loss. Yeah, I think I wrote it backwards. Yeah, I wrote this backwards. I meant to write the other way. 
So when you sell your asset, your vehicle, you get cash. So the cash you get, cash proceeds from sale, in this case, $3,500. We sold a vehicle for $3,500. The vehicle that we sold, at the time we sold the vehicle, its book value, its book value was what? Book value was the balance in the vehicle account minus the balance in the accumulated depreciation vehicle account, 2000. So we wanna subtract the book value at the time of sale, which was 2000. So we sold the vehicle and we received $3,500. And on our books, the vehicle to us was worth $2,000. So we, we sold it for a gain, right? So when this formula is greater than zero, in this case, 3,500 minus 2,000 is $1,500, greater than zero, we have a gain. When this formula in brackets is less than zero, let's do an example of it being less than zero, we have a loss. So let's change this. Less than zero, then we would have a loss. So let's just change the numbers, right? We can keep the book value the same, but say we only received $1,500 for this vehicle. Suppose that we were only received $1,500. So is sold for not $3,500, but $1,500. Then we'd have a loss, right? We received $1,500 for the vehicle. And at the time that we sold it, the vehicle to us was worth $2,000. So we had a $500 loss. So this 1,500 minus 2,000 is negative $500, or another way to say that, $500 loss. So when the formula is negative, there's a loss. When it's positive, there's a gain. I guess this is the way that I said it, and I wrote it the opposite way, and it might've been confusing. But this, this hopefully you understand. You understand this, Christopher? You're welcome, yes. Good question, thanks for the question. I remember being a little, um, it being a little confusing when I was writing it in my mind. I was like, oh, I think I said that the other way when I wrote the formula the opposite way. Any other questions uh, for today? All right, I'm gonna stop sharing. And um, if there's no other questions, I will see you guys on Thursday, and uh, we'll, we'll have office hours Thursday and lecture. I'll send you the links for both on um, Wednesday, so tomorrow. Have a great rest of your day, and I uh, will see you Thursday.